So there's a heated debate in the whiskey world about what's more important for a whiskey's final flavour. Is it the cask that it's aged in or is it the still? So I've done heaps of videos about casks and oak and that sort of thing. So today I am going deep into the world of distillation, which might be the most important thing for whiskey making. Distillation part is a real craft. The shape and style of the still. The vapour is collected and condensed into this clear liquid. Is alcohol in a more concentrated form. So just to note that this is just a really basic overview. There's only so much stuff I can include in this video. So if you're like wanting to get into the industry, this is not really going to be a tutorial for that. This is more for people who are passionate about whiskey and want to know a little bit more about how the whiskey is actually made. So first of all, what even is distillation? Well, in a nutshell, it's basically when you separate a liquid into different parts through evaporation. So in the case of whiskey, what we want to do is to separate the ethanol or the alcohol from the wash. And the wash is basically, like to simplify, it's often called distiller's beer. When you make single malt whiskey, you basically make beer first. It's barley, it's water, it's yeast. The problem is, is it kind of caps at about seven to 10% ABV. Beyond that, the yeast starts to kill itself and you know, you can't really push the alcohol up much further just with fermentation. And the only really way to get the ABV up far beyond this by separating the ethanol out. And we do this through distillation. So the distillation method basically involves heating the wash and collecting the vapors. Because the thing is, alcohol actually boils at a lower temperature than water. So it evaporates first, then we want to cool that back down into a liquid, and then we have a higher ABV product. The alcohol evaporates and rises up the neck, condensing into a clear liquid. So distillation doesn't actually create alcohol, but what it does do is it concentrates it. So let's talk about the two main types of stills used within whiskey production. The first is the pot still, which is used in single malts, blended malts, single pot still Irish whiskey, obviously, as it's in its name. The other main type of still used is the column still, also known as the continuous still. And you often find this will contribute to blended whiskies. So let's talk about what a pot still is. Pot still can vary greatly in size. You know, you can get like home distillers, um, like an NZ, it's legal to distill at home. These things that can fit on top of like your countertop, and then it can go all the way up to these massive, massive pot stills, which can include thousands and thousands of liters of wash. So the pot still is basically just a large pot, and it's heated from the bottom with like a heating element, and basically the alcohol evaporates first, and it goes up this kind of like chimney sort of thing, and then it goes to the head, it starts to cool back down through the line arm and converts back into a liquid through the condensers. So here's the really cool thing about pot stills, is every pot still at every distillery is slightly different, it's slightly different shape, it's slightly different height, and the really cool thing about this is it means that they all end up creating a slightly different flavour and give off slightly different aromas. People say that the still is basically the fingerprint of a distillery's signature spirit. So one of the fundamental ways a shape of a still can influence a whiskey is a thing called reflux, which is basically when the vapors go up the still and they hit like one of the cooler surfaces and then they turn back into a liquid and fall back down and then are redistilled. And the more reflux there is, generally the lighter a whiskey will end up being. So for an example of a lighter style of spirit, Glen Caddam is perfect. Basically their line pipes, they go up a 15 degree angle. So it means that when some of the vapors do convert back into a liquid, rather than falling towards the condenser, they fall back down into the still. This helps the still collect more of those high volatile compounds, which helps keep the spirit more delicate and mellow. Whereas distilleries like Macau which have a downward arm means they capture more of those heavier compounds, those low volatile compounds which have a higher boiling point. Lag stills are designed to give a distinctive heavy flavour profile. The shape discourages reflux from happening. The heavy vapours escape down the line arm. We got all the good vapours that way. So lots of other things that will encourage reflux or discourage reflux. For example, a really tall still like a Glenmorangie will encourage lots of reflux, where a short still will discourage reflux. Or some stills will have like a boil bulb, which will also encourage reflux. Speed is also a factor, as well as the shape of the stills. At La Cranza, they run the still at approximately six litres to seven litres per minute. Here in the south of the island, we run the stills at approximately 10 to 11 litres a minute, pushing the spirit more towards the dark side. 
whiskey. It's important to understand that a still that makes heavier whiskey or a still that makes lighter whiskey, it's not good or bad. Often a still that makes heavier whiskey is desired in a lot of cases. Think about Craig Gallagher, for example, or you know, a still that makes lighter whiskey. Think about Glen Caddam. So the thing you need to know about single bolt whiskey is you don't just distill it once and then goes into the barrel and then you're sweet. Pretty much all single malt whiskey is distilled twice and sometimes three times. And the reason for this is after the first time you distill a whiskey, the alcohol level only ends up being about 20%. And this is called your low wines. So you can't actually legally call it whiskey at this percentage. So the way distillers can get that alcohol level up even further is they put it back through a still again. So larger distilleries, they often have two different stills which are delegated the different jobs for each distillation. At Lag, we have two stills. The wash still at 10,000 litres and we'll get the spirit still at 7,500 litres. So the first still is often called the wash still. So that's the one, obviously, it's taking the wash and it gives you that sort of 20% spirit. And then they re-distill that in a separate still called the spirit still. And that will take the 20% spirit and rise it right up to around 65 to 75% ABV, and that creates the new make. So it's commonly believed the more times you distill a spirit, the lighter the whiskey will end up being. And that's because multiple distillations will often remove some of those heavier compounds from the spirit. And that's why Irish whiskey is often seen as a lighter product than Scotch whiskey, because Scotch whiskey is generally double distilled, whereas Irish whiskey is triple distilled. Distilling it not once, not twice, but three times in our copper pot stills. The mark of a traditional Irish whisky. That third distillation adds the extra smoothness. There are some exceptions though, like Okotoshin, which is triple distilled, and which is often why it's nicknamed the sort of Irish style distillery in Scotland. So before we get on to the next part, I just want to thank my patrons for making this video possible. These types of videos especially take a long time to script, a long time to edit. So it's my patrons that really make it possible. And I feel like the more you learn about whiskey, the more it helps you enjoy the whiskey. So thanks again, patrons, for making this video possible. However, one negative of pot stills is that it has to be done in batches. And because it has to be done in batches, it has to be cleaned and emptied between batches. So it can get really expensive. And that's where the column still comes in. So in the 1800s, this guy called Aeneas Coffey invented the coffee still, also called the column still or the continuous still. So you can learn a little bit about how continuous still is different from a pot still just by the name. It can be run Continuously. What mattered most about the continuous still was the fact that it worked continuously. Which means it doesn't need to be done in batches, which means that it can be more efficient and it can produce a much larger volume of spirit at a much faster pace than a pot still. In, in essence, it can run for days or weeks at a time. So I don't want to get too deep into how a column still works because this will just you know, this video would be like an hour long. But an easy way to picture it is kind of imagine a bunch of pot stills linked together in a column, which is why it's called a column still. So what happens is the wash comes from the top of the still and then the steam comes from the bottom of the still. And then they eventually meet where the steam will remove some of those unwanted substances from the wash and cause the lighter alcohol to rise up with the steam. So the way I like to think about a column still is kind of like one big video game. There's heaps of levels or chambers, and only really the high level, high ABV spirits can make it to that top boss level. It is time for you to stop. And that's because in each chamber, in each level, the vapor hits like a plate, it condenses, and it makes it harder for those heavier substances to carry on through the levels. And only really the sort of pure high ABV spirit can carry on. So eventually it just gets purer and purer and the ABV just keeps rising up till it reaches the top and then it's drawn off by the condenser. So column stills are not used for single malt scotch whiskey, but they're often used in blended whiskies and grain whiskies and a lot of white spirits like some rums, vodka and gin. But what about flavour? How is a column still different in terms of the flavour? Well, the stereotype is basically that a pot still generates a more complex, richer and fuller style of whiskey, whereas a column still will produce kind of a lighter, more neutral flavoured whiskey.
another thing that can really influence the flavor of the final product is the material it's actually made of. And pot steels are pretty much always made with copper, whereas column steels can sometimes be stainless steel or copper or sometimes a mixture of the two. So the reason distilleries love copper is because of its ability to conduct heat evenly across a wash. But copper can also really help with the flavor by the way it interacts with the wash. So copper can help remove and convert some of those heavier compounds like sulfur and convert them to copper sulfate, which ends up sticking to the metal rather than being distilled. And this helps remove a lot of those sulfury and bitter notes which are created during fermentation. And this means that the more copper contact the wash has with the still, the more those bitter and sulfury notes are removed from the distillate which are created during fermentation. However, when ethanol is run through a copper pot still, it eventually will thin the copper over time. And this means these great awesome looking sculptures basically have an expiry date, they'll have to be replaced. And this can be really tricky because when you get a new still, you kind of have to try and replicate the old still as much as possible. Otherwise you're kind of changing the signature spirit style for the distillery. If I was to change one of these stills, to have to make sure every single day, every nook and cranny was the exact same, otherwise it could alter the flavour of the whisky. And because copper contact is such an important part for the flavour of a whisky, it means there's lots of innovations happening at the moment. Like, for example, a local distillery here, Waheke Whisky, has like a geometric design, which apparently causes it to have more copper contact than a regular bulb design. So another really important piece of equipment that distilleries have is the condenser, which also plays a part in the final flavor of a spirit. So the way this works is the vapors rise up through the still along the line arm and they're passed through the condenser. And the main goal of a condenser is to convert those hot vapors back into a liquid, which will become the distillate. And the way it does this is generally through a coolant, typically water, and there's two types of condensers usually used in whiskey production, and they are the shell and tube condenser and worm tubs. So shell and tube condensers are much more common within whiskey production than worm tubs, and that's because they're cheaper to repair, they're often larger, but also save more space, and generally, they're more efficient. And they sound just like their name, it's basically a bunch of cooling tubes surrounded by a large copper shell, and basically the hot vapor runs through these tubes, which is surrounded by circulating cooling water, which causes the hot vapor to turn into a liquid. And a worm tub works in much the same way. It's a long coiled tube, which is the worm, and it runs into a cold tub of water, which is generally outside, and that causes the hot vapors to also turn back into a liquid. In terms of flavor, the worm tub is gonna condense very quickly, and it's gonna give you a much heavier spirit. It's gonna have more body, more sulfuric notes, more like a meaty character, compared to the shell and tube condenser, which would give you a lighter spirit. However, again, heavy doesn't mean bad and lighter doesn't mean bad. It all depends what the distiller wants to create and what you as a whiskey drinker want to drink. So these days shell and tube condensers are much more common throughout the whiskey industry than worm tubs. But worm tubs traditionally used to be used a lot more. But there's only a few distilleries now that still use a worm tub. One good example is this one here, the Craig Gallicky 13. They make a massive point about how important a worm tub is with a massive blurb on the back of every bottle about how it really influences the flavor of their whiskey. So it really just emphasizes the point that it's not just the still, it's not just the cask, but even the condenser can play a part into how the whiskey you're drinking ends up tasting. Okay, so we've got some really cool structures at a distillery. We've got the still, we've got the condenser. But if you visit a distillery, there's another thing you might see, which is also really cool looking, and that is the spirit safe. So when the spirit arrives from the condenser, it comes to the spirit safe, where it has all these levers and it helps the distiller manage where the spirit ends up going with all these cool tools like a hydrometer and a thermometer. So the reason the spirit safe is such an interesting looking instrument is because it's a historic artifact. And that goes back to 1823 with the Excise Act. If you don't know what that is, go watch my History of Scotch video. So basically what the government wanted to prevent was the illegal measurement of the spirit. So basically only the tax man the excise man had the keys and it was padlocked in the safe. 
courtesy of customs and excise, to make sure every drop distilled is accounted for and taxed accordingly. Whereas these days it's largely like just a traditional thing and it's the distiller who has the keys to the safe. But what's the actual functional reason for the spirit safe? Well, not all the compounds captured by the still are actually good. In fact, some of them are actually dangerous and will make you go blind. So what the distiller needs to do is when the new makes coming through, they need to separate it into three parts. And you've got the head, the heart and the tails. Also known as the four shots, the middle run and the feints. So the first part of the spirit run is called the four shots and this is like the first 50 to 200 mils that comes off the still and this is generally pretty bad because it contains methanol and this is the stuff during like prohibition where people home brewing would make them go blind and that sort of thing. So we don't want that and that's why it's called the cut. The distiller is cutting this off and then redirecting it back into the distillation process for further purification. So after the four shots are the heads, and these are not dangerous like the four shots, but they do contain some off notes and sometimes some undesirable notes. And this is where the art of the distiller really comes into play. It really depends on what whiskey they're trying to create, how much heads they want to include. But generally most of the heads is discarded um, and it's redirected to the distillation process, just like the four shots. So the next part of the spirit run is the hearts, and this is the most desired part of the distillate. After 30 minutes, we move the safe arm. We move it across onto the spirit receiver, where we start collecting it, and it's there for about 90 minutes, and this is where we collect the heart of the spirit, the good stuff. Because it contains a lot of those cleaner, more flavoursome compounds. So most of this will be sent to storage tanks and eventually matured into the final whiskey. So the last part of the spirit run is called the tails, also known as the feints. And this is a bit like the heads. Most of it will be discarded because it contains off notes and undesirable notes, which will be redirected to the distillation process. But some distilleries that want a kind of a heavier spirit or something a little bit more funky and rugged will include a little bit more tails. So it just comes down to the distillery and how much they want to include, but most of it will be cut. So the process of collecting that final spirit and cutting off spirit they don't want is called cutting the run, and it's where the judgement of the distiller plays a massive role into how a whiskey ends up tasting. So after the whiskey's collected, it then goes into a spirit receiver, where it's then aged in casks. And if you don't know much about oak or casks, go watch one of those videos. But above all, make sure you share and enjoy. Beauty.